Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the Fathers of the Church, moving into the reign of Pope number 32, St. Miltiades, M-I-L-T-I-A-D-E-S. He reigned from July 2nd, 311, to January 11th, 314. Nine months passed after the death of Pope Eusebius before the 32nd Pope could be selected. St. Miltiades was born in uh, Africa, uh, Roman Africa, so that's North Africa. He was ordained a priest in Rome by St. Marcellinus, managed to survive the intervening years, the persecution of Diocletian, and he lived to see the world change. It was in his reign that Christianity would finally be legalized. <clears throat> in the fall of the year 312, three months after the election of Pope Miltiades, Constantine had to make a decision. His only rival for control of the West was Maxentius, his brother-in-law. So the, the, the decision, should he, Constantine, attack Italy go after Maxentius then, which would require, since Constantine was in present-day France, that would require crossing the Alps, bringing an army across the Alps in the fall. Or should he wait until the following year, giving Maxentius that much more time to consolidate and recruit, but also sparing himself and his army the risk of crossing the Alps in the fall, you know, when a blizzard could end up killing more of his men than a battle. Constantine received a vision uh, of a cross in the sky in front of the sun with the Greek words in totoi nika, meaning in this sign conquer. A phrase better known by the Latin translation in hoc signo vinces, the uh, IHS. He ordered the creation of the labarum, which is the uh, standard that he used for the rest of his life. It was a spear with a, a crossbar making a cruciform shape, and then hanging from the crossbar was a banner. On the banner was the chi rho. That's what it looks like—a P and an X. Uh, that's the first letters of the of 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 Christ, of the name Christ, as written in Greek. So the X in Greek is the chi, the letter chi. So that would be transliterated into ch. And what looks like a p in Greek uh, is, is rho, is, is the r. Is, is, uh, even though it looks like a p, uh, it's the, the r. In Greek, uh, the, the, the Greek letter that would be translated with our letter that looks like a p is pi. So it's, it's which, you know, is just two, two lines with one on top. So, um, Eusebius gives us the uh, account of the vision, uh, this time not, not in the ecclesiastical history, which is the, uh, the source that we've typically been quoting from him, uh, but rather in, he wrote a whole a biography of Constantine. He knew Constantine personally. So it's in the Vita, the life of Constantine, uh, book one, uh, chapters uh, 28 to 32. He, uh, Constantine, now, okay, so how would he know what that was? Constantine's mother, St. Helena, was a Christian. So uh, Constantine knew of Christianity. He was not yet baptized, as we'll see. He got baptized on his deathbed, but he knew of Christianity. So he understood the Christian meaning of the cross when he saw the image. So uh, he decided to risk it. He crossed the Alps with his army. Then, instead of waiting till the following spring, uh, he engaged and defeated one army at Turin before Maxentius even knew that he left Gaul. Maxentius, uh, when he got word, assembled his army, but was not able to get any farther than nine miles north of Rome before Constantine engaged him at Saxa Rubra, the Red Rocks on October 28th, 312. Constantine uh, just outgeneraled him. I mean, he, he just completely outmaneuvered Maxentius. 
such that Maxentius and his army he, 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 had their backs to the Tiber River. And Maxentius also, in the maneuvering, uh, he, he made a, a, a major tactical mistake in that uh, his calv cavalry ended up in the center of the line with the infantry on either side and, instead of the other way around. So it would constrict their movement. So when Constantine made a, a direct attack on the left flank of infantry, it crumbled. And the fleeing men, since they couldn't, they couldn't go back because the river was there, so they ran, they ran into the cavalry, uh, which resulted in total chaos. Maxentius and his troops tried to flee across the bridge. There was a bridge uh, across the Tiber, but it collapsed under their weight. And these guys are wearing armor, so you know that that's it for them. Uh, so that's why this this event is more commonly called the the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, named for the bridge that collapsed. That's M I L V I A N. Uh, and that was it was a, a victory both tactically and strategically. Constantine entered the city of Rome the following day, October twenty ninth, three twelve. For the first time in history, a pope was able to meet personally with an emperor without fear. Pope 32, St. Miltiades. And uh, Constantine, again, he, you know, he, never, he did not become baptized <clears throat> until his deathbed, uh, but in power he consistently favored uh, Christians on account of his mother. <clears throat> So uh, Constantine gave Pope Miltiades the estate of the Laterano family on the Chalian Hill in Rome, which within walking distance of the Colosseum. Uh, this was the family of the first uh, Western Augustus, Maximian, uh, and his son, uh, the recently killed Maxentius. And also the family of, of Constantine's beloved wife, Fausta. So it was a patrician estate. The Laterano, the grounds of the Laterano estate, already had a palace on it, which you know was given to the Pope. And to it, Constantine added a church. Pope Miltiades consecrated this church under the patronage of both St. John the Baptist and uh, St. John the Evangelist. And this, uh, this church is still the cathedral of the Pope in his capacity as Bishop of Rome. Uh, that, like St. Peter's in Rome, is not his cathedral. That St. Peter's is a shrine for the universal church. His actual cathedral, the Pope's actual cathedral for the Diocese of Rome, is St. John. Uh, now, it, there is no St. John Lateran. There's no person named St. John Lateran. So that's just you know, because of linguistic sloth, it's it's just more conventional to say, you know, the Basilica of St. John on the Lateran estate. So they just, you know, become St. John Lateran. Uh, the Lateran estate remained the residence, the official residence of the Holy See until 1305, when the Avignon period began. And the Holy See resided in France for 70 years. When the Holy See returned, in, to Rome in 1377, they, uh, they, it was re, it was the base for the for the for the Apostolic See was put on the other side of the river on Vatican Hill, where Saint Peter's is, and that the Apost the, the See the Holy See remains there even though the Cathedral of the Diocese is still on the other side of the river at Saint John Lateran. The style of architecture of this and the other early post-legalization Christian churches was a basilica style. B-A-S-I-L-I-C-A. -I derived from the, the word basileus, meaning ruler. So the basilica originally was a, a floor plan used for Roman public buildings. So it was a template that engineers and builders had mastered. It was uh, a rectangular uh, footprint on which was placed uh, a building divided internally 
into three longitudinal axes uh, from the entrance. You know, then then you have like three aisles, um, and it, at the opposite end of the rectangle at the, uh, for the entrance would be the place where the magistrate or other public official would be. That's where they would hold, you know, their sessions. The central aisle was uh, on either was lined on either side by columns. Those columns supported a central uh, part that was a double height. Uh, but but that but that double height uh, central section was higher than the than the two side sections. The 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 logic being that that it's called the Clara story, uh, so that uh, windows could be put there which would allow in light and also ventilation, cross draft. So hot air rises, would go into that section and then the cross draft would dissipate it. <clears throat> the uh, two side aisles with a lower, uh, the single height uh, roof, were symmetrically arranged on either side of the center. And they could receive light and ventilation from exterior, from windows through the exterior walls on the ground level. <clears throat> anyway, uh, in the same year as Constantine's victory and gift to the Pope, a new heresy appeared, D the heresy of Donatism, D-O-N-A-T-I-S-M, which was, in fact, just the development of an older heresy that we previously covered, the heresy of Novationism. In the year 312, a guy named Cecilian, was ordained Bishop of Carthage in North Africa. Rigorous bishops, uh, no, novation-minded bishops, from Numidia, also in North Africa but further west, led by Secundus of Tegesi, argued that this guy's ordination as bishop was invalid, not because of anything he did, but because one of, his, one of the bishops who consecrated him a guy named Felix of Eptunga was a traditor. At least, you know, this Secundus accused him of, of, of being a traditor, meaning that he had handed over copies of the scripture during the persecution in order to save himself. Following Novation's example, though Novation himself was long dead, a group uh, around Secundus promoted a schism by electing a rival bishop of Carthage. When that rival bishop died suddenly, they elected another, and that elected replacement was named Donatus, and so he gave his name to the heresy. And they formed their own church, just like the Novations and like the other heresies, the, the Gnostics of the Valentinian variation, the Gnostics of the, of the Marcionite, of the Marcion variation, the Adoptionists, uh, the uh, the Novations, and now we have the Donatist. The Donatist Church, the Donatist Heresy, took rigorous thinking, that moral rigorism that we've seen in Montanism and Novationism, uh, took it uh, to the to its conclusion, extrapolated it, you know, to the, its conclusion by teaching that the validity of the sacraments was contingent on the moral worth or the moral condition of the cleric officiating at the moment he was officiating. <clears throat> at the moment the sacramental act took place. In support of this position, Donatus pointed to the first commandment against idolatry in condemning the lapsed. Said, you know, they, they sacrificed a false god, so they violated the first commandment. Exodus 20. Verses 2 to 5. Uh, Donatus further pointed to the seventh commandment against stealing in condemning the traditors because in handing over the copies of the scripture they took what did not belong to them. And this is before our copy machines, you know, so if you lost the, everything has to be copied by hand. So if you lose that text, some churches, you know, it, it was not easily replaced. 
for his uh, for his argument that God rejects sacraments offered by clergy in a state of sin, he pointed to Matthew chapter six, verse twenty four, in which Jesus said, "One cannot serve two masters, God and Mammon." Further, he cited Galatians chapter five, verses nineteen through twenty one which is one of the lists of sins uh, in Paul's letters. Uh, This one lists the works of the flesh. And in that list, idolatry is included. And St. Paul warned, those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Donatus uh, referred to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 1, in which the prophet denounced Israel for the sin of idolatry. And Jeremiah specifically compared idolatry to adultery. The result being that their sacrifices were no longer acceptable to God. As Jeremiah uh, wrote or said, and it was written that Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 26, as the thief is shamed when caught, so shall the house of Israel be shamed. Naturally, Pope Miltiades condemned Donatism in 312. The mind of the church on the matter is summarized in the Catechism number 1410, which reminds us that it is Christ who offers and is made present in the sacrifice of the Mass. The priest does have a definite role in the sacrament, but it is the sacrifice of Christ that is made present at the Mass. And no sin, regardless of its severity, no sin of a human, has the power to prevent that miracle from happening. So a cleric, a priest or bishop, in a state of sin, such as the lapsed or the traditors, had indeed committed a mortal sin uh, of, of sacrilege or idolatry uh, or idolatry if uh, you know if if he actually sacrificed to the pagan gods uh, and and that person must repent of the sin and seek forgiveness in order to be saved but Christ does not withdraw from his people because of the sins of one person even if that person is ordained In the same year, 312, Constantine sent an invitation to the Eastern Augustus, Valerius Licinius, uh, Licinianus Licinius, so he's just better as uh, Licinius, L-I-C-I-N-I-U-S. He reigned from 308 to 324. So in 312, Constantine invited him to a meeting at Mediolanum, present-day Milan, for a conference to essentially divide the empire between them. Uh, The meeting of the two emperors took place in February of 313 at Milan. Uh, And so they just wanted to set the, the boundary to avoid misunderstandings until they both had enough force to go murder the other and take the whole empire. Because this, I mean, you know, nobody, no one seriously believed this division was going to last. So they agreed on a boundary, and uh, the alliance was sealed with a marriage between Licinius and Constantine's half-sister named Constantia. As part of the conference, Constantine raised the issue of Christianity. And the two agreed that Christianity should be legalized in both halves of the empire. So they signed the famous Edict of Milan on February 23, 313, legalizing Christianity on the 10th anniversary of Diocletian's Edict of Persecution. So the era of the Roman persecutions was over, 249 years after it began with a fire in the city of Rome in 64 AD. 
the text of the edict is found in Eusebius in, in the ecclesiastical history, not the biography, but the ecclesiastical history. Book 9, chapter 10, section 10. And for the sake of time, I won't, you know, I won't, I won't read it because I, I want to get to Nicaea. Uh, so this was later expanded into a decree on religious freedom for all, providing assurances to pagans. And that decree of religious freedom is also in Eusebius, Book 10, Chapter 5, Section 5. Okay, so <clears throat> now legalization, finally. You know, the church is legal. Um, there were some long-term implications for this, uh, in particular the, the, because of the way it happened. So we'll reflect on this for a moment. In socio-cultural terms, pre legalization Christianity was a segmentary and for a time outlaw subculture in the empire. Pre-legalization Christianity therefore abstracted itself so I mean self-understood Christianity as being abstracted from the prevailing social and cultural constructs in the empire such as class, wealth, and ethnicity. And this is based on the biblical imperative to spread the faith to all nations. And as St. Paul famously phrased it in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Post-legalization, Christianity transitioned from this segmentary outlaw subculture into a public organization, including the possibility of integration into the legal constructs of the empire, such as large-scale property ownership and management. Constantine took money from the fisc, from the treasury. It withdrew this to pay for building places of worship, building churches, for what he described with the phrase, quote, the most holy and Catholic church. So this is, you know, Eusebius describes this in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 10, Chapter 6, Sections 1 through 4. Constantine built churches for Christians, as well as permitted them to build their own or and or convert abandoned pagan temples, purify them and reconsecrate them for Christian use. Eusebius discusses examples of that in Book 10, Chapter 3, Sections 1 to 3. Diffusion and acculturation of social constructs, such as inherited wealth status, Exerting pressure, exerted pressure on the New Testament egalitarian ideals, in, in which, you know, when the, the church self understood itself as being abstracted from its surrounding context of the pagan Roman Empire. Such that, post legalization, converts to Christianity who had high social status outside of the church expected to be important and recognized as important in the church. Conversely, they expected those of lower social status outside of the church to remain deferential and submissive to them within the church. Now this did not just happen post-legalization. Even in the New Testament, these pressures were there. An example, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. St. Paul found it necessary to rebuke the Corinthian Christians because of divisions among the rich and poor. Not, not just you know, the fact that there were rich people and poor people, but, but that, you know, that uh, the rich were lording it over, so to speak, to use Jesus' term, uh, the poor. <clears throat> so um, 
it is possible from this point, from legalization on, especially legalization on, to observe the commencement of a meta phenomena in church history. Diffusion, I mean spread, uh, and acculturation, absorption of social mores, uh, social customs, ethnic identities, and legal constructs became inevitable post legalization, which presented both opportunities, you know, there's cost benefits, cost benefit analysis. There were benefits, but there was also a cost. So on the benefit side of the analysis, uh, this this possibility uh, of integrating into uh, the, you know the constructs of the empire openly, not clandestinely but openly as Christians, provided the church an opportunity for inculturation, which we defined in the introduction. But that means that the, the church could openly <clears throat> preach and openly seek converts to try to uh, reform the Roman society from within. So that's a benefit, but on the cost side, the potential cost side of the analysis, remember from the introduction, cultural influence in an, in an interactive environment is never unidirectional. It is always multidirectional and multi-leveled. So the final result of the process was assimilation. It led to prevailing identification of Christianity with Greco-Roman cultural mores, especially after we converted the empire. And in, in, in 390, uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> so this presented an obstacle, in, in a way, in some circumstances, requiring modification because the empire did not last forever. The Western Empire fell, and 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 so the Church, which by that point you know had was was thinking of itself as as part of the Empire, because it was the official religion of the Empire, so the Church had to, uh, you know, re you know, you know, kind of go back to that you know abstracting itself from the from its from the uh, context, and engage non Greco Roman cultures, the Germans and and the Celts. And then later the Slavs and, and Magyars and others <clears throat> that came into the territory that had once been the empire. Now, legalization of Christianity was, of course, an objective good for the church, and it was simple justice that that happened. Yet the manner in which this legalization took place transformed the relationship of church and state from one of secular persecution of the, of the sacred into one in which the secular regarded itself as the special protector of Christianity, imparting an attitude of, of secular entitlement to interference and control over the church, and at which were practices that are alien to the New Testament. <clears throat> now, you know, Constantine, since his mother was Christian, you know, then he had that kind of protective attitude. Uh, and, of course, the empire is not a free society. I mean, so nobody's actually free. <clears throat> but, you know, that... that it, it, well, anyway, okay. So, uh, complicating matters. Legalization did not come about organically by a law of the Senate. It came about by personal fiat of the emperor, who pressured the co-emperor into agreeing. As a result, Constantine had a proprietary attitude with regard to the to Christians, to the church, which he an attitude he passed on to subsequent emperors. And and of course, you know, this is just further exacerbated by by the precedent he set of taking money from the fisc, from the public treasury of a pagan empire in order to build churches for Christians. You know, so in a, in a sense, they were they were government funded. You know, and, and so that that was you know the legal there was some legal logic you know to the to the government's uh, interfering in the church. So well, public funds you know were used for, for the, so you see the so remember 
you know, go, well, government support, you know, money from the from the state throughout history is, is you know, there, there were advantages to it to provide some stability and some security, but uh, government money always comes complete with a collar and leash. Always, always, one hundred percent of the time. And, and and the leash will get tugged, you know. Now it may it may happen ten seconds after the money is given. It may happen, you know, ten weeks or ten months or ten years after. But eventually, yeah, chain's going to get pulled. The first example in which the chain got pulled of uh, post legalization government interference in the hierarchy in the authority structure of the church was a continuation of a problem that immediately preceded legalization, specifically donatism. After legalization, the donatist wrote to Constantine protesting their condemnation by Pope Miltiades. They said, we're from North Africa. Pope Miltiades was from North Africa, so he had a pre-existing bias against them, they said. So they demanded a fair and impartial hearing by means of a change of venue, as we would say today, and and being and and being uh, presided over by judges with no prior involvement in the region, who were not from North Roman Africa and had no relatives there, and a decision that fundamentally altered history, church history, and practice. Constantine agreed and ordered a council of prelates to meet in Gaul in the city of Aralate, which is present-day Arles in Provence, southern France. So that's uh, A-R-L-E-S. Since Constantine only controlled the West at the time, this was not an ecumenical council. It was a synod of the, of the western half of the empire. Yet the senator and Arles looms in, in mountainous proportions historically because it revealed the cost of imperial patronage and, and you know, the, the, the cost of, of receiving government funds, government support. Constantine appointed uh, the Bishop of Syracuse on, from the island of Sicily, whose, whose name happened to be Crestus, so, you know, Christ, yeah. Uh, to preside over the council, granting the Donatist demand for an impartial judge and a change of venue. More baneful still was the precedent of an emperor accepting an appeal on a matter of theology against a ruling already made by the Pope, a Pope that he did recognize and had, and had endowed with churches. Pope Miltiades gave no response to this because he died uh, on January 11th, 314. So uh, the next the next pope will have to deal with this. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, let's see, Miltiades, uh, he ordained uh, 13 priests, uh, three deacons, and 14 bishops in the month of December, but this is from the LP, so it doesn't give us the year. Uh All right. Uh, oh, no, excuse me. No, I was reading that. Uh, Miltiades held, uh, uh, ordained seven priests, five deacons, and 11 bishops. Sorry, that was uh, Miltiades did, uh, in the month of December, but again, doesn't give us the year. <clears throat> and uh, a cause of death isn't given, but, you know, he. he would not be a martyr uh, because, you know, it was legal, legalization. Uh, and it, his remains were, were placed in the catacombs of St. Callistus on December 10th. And uh, that's it. So the next pope is Pope number 33, St. Sylvester I. And it's during his reign that the first ecumenical council took place, the Council of Nicaea. So we will close here and then pick up with Sylvester next time. Thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.